But the key to running a museum is membership. And um, with, a, with an art show and sale, and I'll, I'll come back to the Briscoe in a minute, but with an art show and sale, you get people to engage your museum, they get to buy a piece of Western art, and then, they're, then, they're, then they own a piece of it, right? Then they're in your business, essentially. Mm -hmm. And they come back year after year, you make sure it's a fun party. And then you've got a transactional relationship with that person, just like a lot of the people in the gallery. But then the trick and the magic is to convert the transactional relationship into a philanthropic relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm getting old hat at doing all these interviews. <laughs> right, right, that's good. I'm closing in at all, on 100, so. Yeah, there was a long list, really great. I can't wait to listen to most of them or all of them. Yeah, you know, they're all interesting. So, yeah. I, I, by the way, we're talking to Michael DeShaman here today. Very good. See, I got the last got name. It. Yeah. DeShaman. I'll see if I can do it at the end. <laughs> but uh, Michael is the president and CEO Correct. of the uh, Briscoe Museum in San Antonio, Texas, along the Riverwalk. How about that? I did all my research. <laughs> it's a great location. Yeah, you know, that actually is a great location. Yeah. And San Antonio is like, what, the fourth largest city in America? Seventh. Seventh. Yeah, but it's uh, 1.5 million, 2.5 metro. Yeah, so that's it. Yes. Yeah. So that's an amazing amount of people, 4 million people, people. Everybody from California who used to move here are moving there now. You mean used to move to Arizona? Right. Good. Yeah. Let's keep them in San Antonio. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fast-growing market. It's an old Western town, of course, an old Spanish and yeah. Mexican town before that. Uh, settled it in 1718. Yeah. Wow, that's really early. Yeah, yeah. my uh, grand, great-grandparents got there in the 1850s. Oh, really? To Texas. Okay. Yeah, like five generations of Texans. Wow. Yeah, we could go a whole long story on my Texas roots. <laughs> I'll do, all I'll say is my uh, great-grandfather was named Samuel Houston Sublet. And there's a nice. reason for that. Sure. <laughs> well, we uh, our uh, uh, tagline for the Briscoe is the West starts here. And my goal, and I've only been there three years, but my goal is to really show how San Antonio is part of the greater American West. As you know, everything in Texas seems to be about Texas. And we're trying to, uh, as a Western art museum, really connect San Antonio to a bigger story. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so far, that's going pretty well. And so what is that bigger story? Well, there's really, I look at San Antonio as a crossroads. And so there's two main themes. And we're talking an old crossroads. An old crossroads, yes. correct, yeah. I mean, you can go back to the earliest trading days um, because there's good water. You know, One thing that's surprising about Texas being from the other parts of the Southwest is the water there is good. There's Plentiful. seven rivers that drain the state. They all come down out of the uh, mountains of New Mexico. And uh, San Antonio River has its headwaters right there mm -hmm. in the city and drains into the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico near Corpus Christi. But uh, um, there's, I, looked, I took the uh, cardinal points of a compass and made two basic stories. The first one, and because we're a museum of the American West, we really start with the Mexican session. Because if we told the entire story of San Antonio, uh, we'd, we'd never get out of the Spanish period, really. Mm -hmm. So we begin in 1849, and we look at um, what, it, what was the creation of the Southwest with an idea that you have to have a Southwest before you can have Southwest art. So we start with the question of what is the Southwest and how did it get created? And that's the Mexican session um, uh, giving land to the U.S. or yeah, like that's the, the U.S. 18, taking yeah, land. That's 18, so right after the Mexican-American War of right. 1848 and the Gas and Purchase of 1853? 53. So yeah. we, we start in 1849. That's the year of the Boundary Survey. But more important, it's the year of the California Gold Rush. Yeah. And the, the, where San Antonio first gets on the American map is with the Gold Rush. And the you know lots of people heading west to California, and the Southern Immigrant Trail, which came through the Gila Trail here in Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, but came through Tucson as well, going to San San Diego and then up into the gold fields. So that's one story, and that's a story that gets us to the whole notion of Southwest art, which becomes a big part of Western art as we move forward into the 20th and 21st century. The other story is the Lonesome Dove story. It's the trail drives that start in South Texas, cattle and horses that go north and really they go to the Dodge City and other railheads, right. but they also feed all the ranches in the entire Rocky Mountain region and up into Canada, all the livestock in those areas, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, 
uh, Alberta, Montana, uh, they start in Texas. And so you have a north-south story there. And that's that kind of 1870s to early 80s? Yeah, 65 to 85, yeah. that time period. And so those two stories at the root are the crossroads of San Antonio. And they, uh, San Antonio is uh, on the trail for both of those, and really the jumping off point into what we would call the American West today. Hmm. So there's, a, there's another story I don't know, and that's the story of you. Yeah. Where do you begin? Where do I begin? Yeah, where do, where do I begin? Yeah, where do you yeah. grow up? <laughs> I, uh, I was born in Duluth, Minnesota. Okay. Grew up in the area around Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, left there in uh, 1984. Moved to Arizona. Before we moved to Arizona and you yeah. grew up, I want to know more about Duluth. So you went sure. to school in Duluth? No, I was born there and I was. we moved before I was one years old. Uh -huh. And then so, where did you go? Uh, a town called Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. It's a northern suburb of Milwaukee. I uh, grew up there till I was 17. What did your mom and dad do? My dad was a mining engineer. Uh -huh. So a lot of the stone crushers in Ari well, really ever Arizona, New Mexico, he worked for a company called Nordberg, and then later they merged with Rex Chain Belt to form Rex Nord. And his job was to install a lot of the stone crushers that you find in these mining operations throughout the West. These are huge machines, Huge right? machines, yeah. Uh, making sand and gravel, but crushing other bigger stone and, uh, and then servicing them, you know, once they were installed. So every summer as a kid, we would go on road trips. Uh, early on, we stayed in motels um, and he would go out and service these machines and take the family along. Mm -hmm. And I'd spend a lot of time at Howard Johnson and Holiday Inn. And wow, playing, I could, we couldn't afford Howard Johnson's actually. Yeah. Well, those yeah, are too, yeah. No, those are too expensive for my family. He had family. an expensive cup. <laughs> you did. Uh, and then that was uh, our dream place was Howard right. Johnson's. They had all that food you could eat. Right. <laughs> yeah, I still remember the clam. Yeah, the yeah, cl no. fried clams. Yeah. Uh, uh, I haven't thought about that in a long time. And then uh, later we got a camper and we would do camping trips. My mom wanted to camp and get a little closer to nature. So. And these would be the Southwest you would go often or the West? You know, really uh, from Colorado, Utah, California, and South all the way through, you know, that region. He didn't do a lot in the Northern states, Montana, Washington. But Arizona, New Mexico? Arizona, what? New Mexico a lot and Colorado a lot too. And so what years would these be that you're doing mm, these camping? And, and This would be... In the 60s. Like yeah. mid-60s? The, yeah, the whole decade, probably. Uh, early 70s, you know, I, once I got my driver's license, I was done with the family trips. I yeah. was doing my own trips then. <laughs> uh, but yeah, probably um, the ones I remember the best would be from about 64 to 73. And was, like were you exposed to Western art? Was that kind of your first understanding Foreign, yeah. of, you know, native arts, Western art? A little bit, Mo mostly the you know the trading store trading post. type stuff, yeah. Hubble's Trading Post and places like that. Uh, my mom had a two Gray Hills blanket that uh, she bought off the loom in the 1930s. Uh, well, there's a story. Well, How did yeah. that happen? I don't really know all the details of it, but they she was there. Um, she was uh, wanted to buy something. And um, the woman was just was men or women who weave. women weave. weave. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, she was she was finishing this blanket, so mm -hmm. she waited for it to be done. She tied it off and she bought it, and then kept it as a family heirloom. I have it now; it's hanging on my living room wall. Hmm. But um, do you know where it was purchased? Was it purchased at Two Gray Hills? You know the or Totalina? The um, the history behind it has been lost in the family, but I'll send you a picture. Send me a picture, and I'll, we'll see if we get me. the 30s part, right? Yeah, yeah. How old's your mom? I mean, does it fit she right was, to the 30s? She was born in 1910, Oh, yeah. 12. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, so it does yeah. fit. Yeah. She's been gone for quite a while. I'm yeah. the youngest of eight. Yeah, there you go. So uh, There's also a story. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, youngest of eight. So right. when you would go to these Howard Johnsons, there would be... Loaded no, with no, how many I, kids? Being the youngest, there was me and my sister. Okay. Um, and my sister's 10 years older than I am. Everybody else was out of the house. So they couldn't afford to take the whole yeah. the whole brood. So um, as my other brothers and sisters would say, I kind of got, we got a dishwasher when my sister moved out. So <laughs> being the youngest, I got all the advantages that oh, yeah, for my sure. siblings didn't get. Uh, uh, but yeah, we did a lot of traveling in those days. I don't think my appreciation for art really came, it came later uh, once I got into college. Mm -hmm. And I 
uh, came out to Arizona, went to Arizona State and got my master's degree there. But you, where did you, you went to? Uh, University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin for my undergraduate work in Stevens Point. Now, was that during the Vietnam War? It was right after. So I, I, went, I graduated high school in 77. Okay. Um, yeah, me and too. I was in that period where I didn't even have to yeah. apply for the draft. Right. Um, and, uh, but I grew up in that, you know. Post- yeah, well, you had eight siblings. So some of your brothers, yeah. I assume, did they have to go to Vietnam? I had one brother that went to Korea and one brother that went to Vietnam. Wow. And did they come home? They both came home. Yeah. Um, you know, they're more or less okay, but yeah, every, they, everybody that went there came back damaged at some yeah. level. So they were affected. Yeah. And my brother, I found out later, uh, actually, as he was uh, reaching the end of his life, um, that he, we, my mom, we all thought he was in Korea, but he was doing recon in Vietnam oh, wow. uh, back before yeah. we, we got into Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, in a you know an undercover sort of way, so they were yeah mapping the trails and yeah. doing all that sort of thing. He my my mom, he told my mom that he was a um, like a security guard in the in Korea. Uh-huh. But later I learned that's not what he was doing. Yeah, he was actually in. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was early on. Yeah, we got into it really with uh, Kennedy is when we first got in there. Right. So we were there a long time. A long time. Early, yeah. Fifty nine, I think, is when we first really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and then a big turning point for me in that period, maybe you too, reading the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. You know, that changed everything. Yeah. And we still live in that period and where you find out the government's been lying to you forever. It's really hard to get over mm-hmm. and it keeps going. Um, and then Watergate, of course, and um, all the protest movements and anti war movement, the civil rights right. movement, and then all the assassinations. You know, people. Kids today think about, you know, the dark times we may or may not be going through now and since 9-11. But, man, the 70s for me were a lot bleaker than anything Yeah, we had a lot of things. Yeah, we got yeah. Martin Luther King was killed, Robert right. Kennedy. Robert Kennedy. We can still remember John F. Kennedy right. being assassinated, all those kind of things. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. I yeah. mean, it's a long list. There is a long list. And then all the, remember the... Uh, the planes being hijacked to Cuba. Oh, yeah. That was like a weekly occurrence. Yeah. <laughs> no one ever talks about that anymore. No, no. And the Olympics, too. And the Olympics, and, right. You know, right. With the 72. Yeah, 72. I remember that very well. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, there are a lot of things that in our generation, that's kind of what made us, and I think the music changed us, too. Yeah. The question is, did you have long hair? You were, oh, yeah. You, were, yeah, you did. Good. I had hair. I had yeah. a lot more hair. When you had hair. It was bright red. Yeah. Uh, I grew a beard um, pretty early, and I started out in the museum field. Well, let me give you the rest of the backstory. Yeah, I want first. the whole backstory. I'm yeah. just going to take you there anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, so I grew up in Wisconsin. I went. I started out as a pre-law finance major, and I figured I had lawyers in my family. I figured I'd become a lawyer and make lots of money. And um, I always had a head for numbers, um, and so I liked that part of it. But then I spent a year taking you know your basic classes and mm-hmm. thinking about being a lawyer. And I realized that lawyers just deal with other people's problems all day long. Yeah, they That's do. what they do. Mm-hmm. Now, there's certain aspects of law where you can probably, you know, get away from that. But bottom line is nobody calls a lawyer unless you need a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And it's always some problem that someone's dealing with. And of course, it can be interesting. Lots of it is. But I didn't want to spend my life dealing with other people's problems. So I drifted for a little bit. Um, was really, you know, I took an English class as an undergrad and I got into this notion at that time, again, in the 70s, about what does it really mean to be an American? Because we'd been in a consensus society up into the 60s that got blown apart um, during the 60s. And then redefining ourselves as a people, as a, as a generation, mm-hmm. all of that uh, became kind of my lifelong obsession. And so I started reading literature, travel literature, about Americans traveling in Europe and Europeans traveling in the United States and just comparing what what travelers here said about us, like uh, uh, de Tocqueville's Democracy in America is a good example, mm-hmm. Mark Twain traveling in Europe and throughout the West. And those stories really got me thinking about you know, my own personal identity and my identity, my national identity, all of those kinds of things. And of course, that's a period where um, we moved into the hyphenated America where no one identified it as American anymore. You were 
Mexican American, African American, Native American, mm -hmm. Irish American, yeah. whatever Chicano. it might be, Chicano, and but no one was ever just a, American anymore, mm -hmm. and we're still in that period, you know, where identity politics is what rules um, our world today, and uh, someday that pendulum, I hope, will swing back towards some type of new consensus, where we're American first and then our other identity second. We're not there yet. Doesn't yeah. look like it'll happen. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. No. So. And we're just growing as a country, right? Yeah. So, you know, what do we do when we have 500 million people? Right. So it's be even more hard, I think. So, but, I, and we still haven't learned, at least the baby boomer generation never learned how to contend with that, really. Yeah. You know, well, we'll be, we'll be gone soon. Yeah. So, <laughs> maybe band aid it, but not, not really address it. Uh, so, um, yeah, that got me interested in, American studies, history, English, Broadfield, social science. I have a quadruple degree as an undergrad. Wow. Um, not that I tried to do that. <laughs> Your uh, parents must have been so thrilled. <laughs> yeah, yes, four majors and you can't years, find a job. <laughs> how many years did it take you to get through that one? Uh, it was only four and a half, five oh, wow. years. Yeah, so yeah. you were pushing it. Well, and what happened is that the classes counted for multiple majors. That was the way I did it. And when, when I was uh, finishing my program, uh, one of my professors was going through and writing a letter of recommendation for me, and he realized I had enough credits for the social science degree, so he added it to my uh -huh. uh, to my uh, diploma. Right. Uh, so I ended up with a quadruple major, but so it was social science, history, English, English, and American studies. Oh yeah, that's a good, that's a really good basic, very well yeah. rounded. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, and so I you know I graduated from college and. 81. This was Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Yeah, so you were right on schedule. No jobs, recession, yeah. the Reagan recession. Yeah. And uh, the two jobs I could get were <laughs> bank teller or insurance agent. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, I'm not doing that, either one. So I, I, had, a, I had a job delivering um, soda pop uh, and beer and mixers and all that kind of thing. It was a company called Canada Dry Groffs. And in those days, uh, soda came in um, eight packs of glass bottles. Mm -hmm. Remember that with a mm -hmm. cardboard carton, three of those in a wooden crate. One of those things weighed seventy-five pounds <laughs> full, yeah. and I was delivering four hundred a day. You know, pulling them out of the truck, throwing them up in the truck. You're getting big quick. I was, you know, played football, yeah. so we won the first state championship in Double <laughs> A in Wisconsin yeah. ever. Yeah, it well. was nineteen seventy-seven. Uh, and, uh, anyway, I was, I've always been a big guy and I got, I was really big then and, uh, um, went back to that job when I graduated because there were no other jobs. It's not worth telling, but that company went out of business and I was then drifting, trying to, I had a summer where I could do anything I wanted mm -hmm. on unemployment. My girlfriend lived 150 miles away. Yeah. I was, you know, free, nothing to do. And, and, uh, uh, just partied that summer. Was so, that like 82? That was the summer of, yeah, 82 yeah. into 83. And um, Milwaukee does a big music festival every summer called Summerfest, which is fantastic, 10-day music festival. So I did Summerfest for 10 days. Then I applied for a new program in public history at Arizona State. Uh, it was a second class. This would have been 83. And uh, um, they didn't have any vacancies. I figured it'd take me a year to get into the school. Somebody dropped out. Uh, Noel Stowe was a professor. Called me and he said, "Hey, I got an opening. If you mm -hmm. can get here, you got to go take your, you know, your entrance exams." I'd been out of school for a year and I hadn't picked up a book in a year. Yeah. And, and, he, <laughs> and he said, "Well, I need those results, you know, next week." Right. So I went and took the test with no studying whatsoever. I think, well, you know, all I can do is fail. Right. So I went in and they, I did good enough for them to accept me. They must have been desperate. <laughs> And I, so I started. Well, it was out, ASU. After it was all. ASU. I just yeah. want to point that out as a Tucson guy. <laughs> anyway, I got into that class, started studying public history, which is training historians to work in non academic settings. Mm -hmm. And the option I chose was a business option. So working for Wells Fargo or Coca Cola or a company that uses their history in their marketing. Mm. That's, that's what I was aiming for. And uh, about a year into that program, uh, or finished two semesters, and then I was looking for a summer job. Got three offers. One was with AT&T to go to Orange, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I'd written a paper on the utility of the telegraph when it was new technology in the 1840s, and they liked it and offered me an internship. 
A second one was with the Historic Building Survey, doing a being the historian on the preservation project for Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Mm. And the third one was with A.J. Bayless Markets, which were located in Phoenix. And I just moved across country to Phoenix, and I didn't really feel like going to Fort Leavenworth. Or girlfriend to, come with you or not? No, my girlfriend ended up in... Uh, in uh, Monterey. Okay. She was studying Russian at the institute, the language institute up there. Um, we were off and on for a while, but um, didn't pan out in the long yeah. run. And uh, and so I took the... Hey, know, job? Well, I, took, I had two semesters of college, didn't know anything about museums. I went to the library, got saw the announcement. I went to the library. I checked out the nine books on museums that were in the library. ASU, of course. ASU. Yeah, okay. And the program, this program really taught you how to, what was what we called gutting a book. So to get into it and figure out what the gist of it is in a hurry. So I spent, I went to the museum, actually I went to the museum first, which is the Old Country Store Museum. I don't, were you ever in mm-hmm. that place? Mm-hmm. It was on Indian School Road in Central Avenue. I know where that is. And Bayless in the 1950s had built a modern Bayless market, a King George's all-you-can-eat buffet, and a gold bond stamp company in the middle, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then this old country store museum on the end with a um, working soda fountain in it, marble soda fountain. And the idea was to juxtapose the old long term that Bayless had been in the food merchandising business, the old country store with the modern supermarket. And then the museum was just a hodgepodge of everything that AJ wanted to collect, which was extensive. That all ended up in the collection of the Arizona Historical Society in the Tempe branch. Mm. So I ended up getting them to donate that as time went by. Um, but the, it was the best uh, story. I applied for this, well, I spent four hours in the museum, checked out all the books, did what Noel Stowe taught me to do, and that was to do a one-page report, basically. Mm-hmm. One paragraph that said, here's what you've got. Second paragraph said, here's what the literature says you need to do. And the third paragraph was my three-point plan to transform the museum. I can't remember the guy's name, but he picks up the phone. He goes, Esther, cancel the rest of the interviews. We found our man. <laughs> Hung up the oh, that's phone. a great thing. <laughs> so that's how I got into the museum business. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, um, I tried to do a big uh, project with them with National Cash Register mm-hmm. that I won't take the time to explain all of it. But uh, uh, the upshot of that was that I determined that the collection was not owned by the company. So, uh, Southland Corporation, 7-Eleven stores had bought the A.J. Bayless markets, but mm. they didn't buy the collection. They only bought the rights to operate the mm. museum. I see. So they ended up giving it back to the Bayless family, and I figured I was out of a job. And the Bayless family said, no, we'll keep the museum open, but we're not going to do anything with it. We're not going to do anything to improve it. We're just going to ha- do 40,000 school kids a year and and all that. <laughs> and so it was a great job to work my way through college because I did those tours in the morning and the rest of the day, really not much to do, but sit behind the counter and read and study and visit when some you know people yeah. came in occasionally. When did they close that museum though? Well, um, it was around 87. 87, I left to go to the Arizona Historical Society, and I got in on the ground floor of building their Central Arizona Museum in Papago Park. And um, the museum closed sometime after that, and the family donated the entire collection to the Arizona Mm -hmm. Historical Society, and it became the core of the uh, HS's 20th century collections, which are, in those days, Tucson was focused on the 19th century and earlier, and Phoenix was focused on the 20th century, and then Yuma and Flagstaff were kind of regional mm-hmm. branch museums. So um, got all that put together, helped build the new building, moved from the Ellis Shackelford House, which is where the Arizona Humanities Council is now, into Papago Park. That was 93. Another recession hit. My boss was take, had taken a job to go to um, the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame and in uh, Colorado Springs, and he recommended me to the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. I went out there and interviewed for a job, and they said, well, you're not qualified for the job we have open, but we like you, so we'll make a different job for you. What was the job you were trying to get? It was a a folk life, folk art, uh, curatorial position, Mm -hmm. Um, and that really wasn't, just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, And how long did you do the Arizona Historical? Three years? Yeah, I was there six years. Oh, you were there six years? 87 to 93. Oh, okay. Um, started as a, let's see, I had three jobs as the volunteer coordinator, the education manager, and the, uh, curator. I think that was it. 
And um, I'd have to check my resume, be sure. Uh, <laughs> but the best thing about that is that Andy Masick, did you ever know mm. Andy? He was the director there for a long time. Uh, he's now at the Heinz Center in, in Pittsburgh. He's been there forever. Um, but Andy had done this exhibit where they built a time machine based on the 1960s movie. Mm -hmm. It was really quite good. I ended up owning it personally after <laughs> they decommissioned it. But he had it on the second floor of this building, and he had this um, Battle of Picacho Pass yeah, set up with, mm -hmm. you know, he was big with the Civil War reenactment mm -hmm. folks. And uh, they had set this up. And so long story short, after a while, they, they took that exhibit apart, or we did. They decommissioned the time machine, and a buddy of mine, Dennis Preisler and I, we bought it. We moved it to Dennis's backyard, and we used it as the signature piece for lots of parties. I was going to say, ASU this was like a party house. And, and, but during that period, I became the curator of time travel. Uh -huh. And so my job, and I ran a living history program, and my job was to go out to county fair, state fair, all those places, bring the time machine along, and use it as the device that brought Charlotte Hall and El Vaquero 1880 and all these characters from Arizona's past, from the past into the present. Mm -hmm. We did uh, promos on the Wallace and Ladmo show. That was the old children's uh, TV show in Phoenix and uh, to create this sense of disbelief. And so after it came out of the exhibit, it lived as a traveling uh, program for a long time. I had seven reenactors as part of that program. Did you have Maynard Dixon coming out? Didn't have yeah, it, but I, you know, have. if if we were still doing it, he'd be in the mix. <laughs> he would have been perfect. Uh, he knew Charlotte Hall and all those guys. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, he's got amazing history. Yeah. And, you know, I just saw the exhibit at the Scottsdale Museum yep. of the West, and, and um, you know, his long history in Arizona was something that I was, um, I mean, I was aware that he was here, but I didn't realize he lived in Tucson. Yeah. Um, where did he live here? Uh, 2255 East Prince Road. In, okay, is yeah. that down closer so to downtown? So it's, it's middle of the city now, but it would okay. have been the boonies. It's basically Country Club and uh, Tucson Boulevard, I believe. Okay. And so kind of over, you know, where the uh, uh, breast center, the cancer center sure. is, oh, kind of over there off Prince Road, 2255 okay. East Prince Road. And, you know, it's been kept as uh, the essence of that house is still the same. The person who owns it now who lives in it, it's their home, but right. you know they kept the, the understanding of who it was and bought it because it was Dixon's home. Sure. So yeah, it's still there. Well, he he was an amazing guy. I've been to his uh, summer house up in Mount Carmel, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was really an interesting, uh, you know, great location. Yep. Interesting that he landed there for the summers uh, near Zion National Park, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, that's where I really got my first taste of my my interest in the West has always been art, history, and popular culture, kind of as a mix. Mm -hmm. We did that at the Historical Society. When I moved to the Autry Museum in Los Angeles, it was even more so. I ended up spending the bulk of my career at the Autry. I was there sixteen years. So ninety three, ninety three to two thousand eight. Okay, yeah, that's a long time. And what was yeah. your uh, position? It probably so changed I, periodically. Yeah, but... I started out as a curator of history. Yeah. And uh, what I really did for the Autry more than anything was put their exhibition program together, developed a five-year plan. We were doing, I don't know, five, six shows a year. Mm -hmm. And up and through 97, 98, somewhere in there, first five or six years, maybe even a little longer, um, there wasn't a single project I ever proposed that they said no to. Because mm. Gene had more money than he could, knew what to do with. And so we were doing million dollar exhibit projects one mm -hmm. after another. And I got to do, all, you know, Walt Disney's Wild West. That was in 95. It was a 35th anniversary of Disney. And so it was all the ways in which mm. Disney and, and all their manifestations tackled the West. Right. Did a show called Western Wonderlands about tourism and national parks. Uh, my first project there was a community gallery, a permanent exhibit, which really looked at um, race, ethnicity, um, as the basis for community formation and development. So I went into the 1890 census and looked at when the West was closing, when Frederick Jackson Turner wrote, there's no more frontier, mm -hmm. what did the West actually look like? So I went into every single county in all the Western states and I mapped on a basis of race and ethnicity, you know, who was living there. Mm. And so I found where, you know, the Swedes were and where the Mexicans were and where the Germans were mm -hmm. and the Irish and African Americans and on, on and on and on. And we then built an exhibit around that. We used, it's still at the Autry. It's been, mm. it opened in 94. Mm -hmm. 
what is that? A long time. Long time ago. Yeah, 26 and, years ago. And, you know, these exhibits should last 10 years. And at 26 later, years later, I'm pl- proud to say it's still there. Well, it'll so. always be current in a way. I mean, because yeah. that was from the 1890 census. Right. And I assume they would undercount Native Americans and something like that or not even count. <laughs> well, it was all um, the Native American counts were really the reservations. And they had a good count of who was on the reservations. Uh-huh. But anyone that was off reservation would have been mixed or, or um, yeah. not counted. Yeah. Uh, Southern Arizona and Southern Arizona especially had an interesting, because there was a distinction between Mexicanos, which were people from Mexico, and Mexican Americans, which were people of Mexican descent mm-hmm. living in the U.S., either naturalized or having been born here um, after it became part of the U.S., um, and there was an understanding that these populations were mixed in a way that you couldn't really distinguish who was who, mm-hmm. but there was a differentiation that was they, t- they tried to make. Um, and so that was kind of complicated because it wasn't one group but two groups uh, that you had to kind of display together. Um, and in those, this was the early 90s. It was kind of tricky on how you were, what language you were going to use and what you were going to say. Mm-hmm. And I was really worried that... Uh, um, you know, I'd get big criticism for uh, how I tackled some of these subjects, and that never came. Mm. I think people were just happy to see. You know, no one in museum in in history museums. It's pretty early to be tackling race and ethnicity as a topic in the early '90s, right? And uh, a lot more of that's been done since. But I'm just happy the exhibit's it's still, still there. Up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was really my big start. I How'd did, you like living in LA? In LA, I, I love LA. You know, I yeah. still have a house there. Huh? In fact, that's where I'm traveling between LA and San uh-huh. Antonio right now. Um, you know, if you want, if you don't have to get on the freeway and and have a long commute, it's really a great place to live. There's a lot of people, but every city, Tucson has a lot of people. No. Yeah, <laughs> they're all big million cities. people. Yeah, well, a million people is a lot of people. <laughs> um, well, LA is what the base in twenty million. Uh, 17 plus, yeah, somewhere yeah. in there. But, you know, my neighborhood, uh, my street, no sidewalks, no street lights. It's unincorporated. Huh. It's surrounded by a mass of humanity, but it's in a little area called Crescenta Valley. And uh, I know all my neighbors, and it's, you know, it's just could be anywhere, small town America, anywhere. Yeah. And that's the thing. LA is a hundred little cities that merge together yeah. over time. Um, well, the, when Loomis was there, I mean, it really was a small city. Yeah, yeah. And you must have been somewhat involved with Loomis just toward the end with his uh, the Southwest Museum getting incorporated into the Autry. Well, that was 2003. We did three deals in 2003. One was, the first one was the acquisition of the Women of the West Museum, which was a museum out of Denver, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. Mm-hmm. They had raised a million dollars, and they wanted to build a bricks-and-mortar museum, and they realized they weren't going to get that done. We had done some really significant projects at the Autry, so they Mm -hmm. called us and said, we would like you to acquire us. Mm. So we acquired their collection, which was mainly early um, web-based exhibits from the what would have been the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Um, They had a million dollars in cash, which came to the Autry. Mrs. Autry matched it with another million, and we created the um, the chair of Western Women's History, which is held by Gingy Scharf at the University of New Mexico, and a curator of Western Women's History, mm. which is held by Carolyn Brucken. And from that point forward, that was 2003, from that point forward, every project that the Autry did considered mm-hmm. a, a female perspective within the context of the project. And then there were several projects that were specifically mm-hmm. about women that mm-hmm. were also done. So um, that was kind of a change event. The second thing that happened was the merger with the Southwest Museum of the American Indian. Um, and that was the Cowboys taking over the Indians. That's how it got billed in Los Angeles. But the Southwest Museum was at a point in 2003 where they weren't going to make payroll. They were, it was going to close. They were talking mm. about selling off the collection. God. Um, and, you know, there's a million objects in that collection. Right. A lot of archaeology, but a lot of prime uh, oh yeah, material, and it's the Lemus collection, Charles yeah. Lemus, and uh, um, and so the Autry truly saved that collection. But um, we did a, a preservation study of the building, yeah, the Southwest Museum building, yeah, and horrible eighteen million dollars in two thousand three to get that place up to the point where you could use it, and then it wasn't going to be accessible because of 
It wasn't. It was built in 1915. Right, Lummis built it himself. Yeah, and it was <laughs> up on a hill, and you, an elevator through a mountain to get there, and right, um, and it just wasn't very practical, and you could never do volume of people there. So the plan was to to keep it as a, you know, do get into a community collaboration for mm-hmm. the building, and then build a new Southwest Museum on the campus right. uh, where the Autry Museum was. We had nine acres in Griffith Park, and. Uh, uh, they wouldn't let us do that. Uh, the, there was a community group that refused to allow the Southwest Museum to move. It's the same group that held up building the um, the subway system in Los Angeles for about at least a generation. Um, and so they were formidable. They lived in Mount Washington. And so that didn't happen. Long story short there is the Southwest collection was taken out of the building. A new collection center was built in Burbank where everything is now housed. Mm. The Autry has gutted all of their back of house areas, which is about 75 to 100,000 square feet, moved all that into this new collection center. And they're now doing a $90 million campaign to remodel inside the footprint of the original building to incorporate the Southwest Museum into the Autry Museum. So they'll both have one entrance and then two museums within Mm. there. And they don't have to build a separate building. And under those terms, no one can tell you what to remodel inside your building. Right. They can keep you from building another building, but they can't stop you from remodeling inside. And so um, many millions of dollars later and lots of fighting and legal hassling, and that's what's happening. And the Autry's on the verge of really making that dream come true. Um, and then the third thing that happened in 2003 was... Um, really a long-term loan agreement with the California Historical Society. Mm -hmm. California Historical Society in those days was also on the verge of going under, and they needed a bailout. And the Autry stepped in, did a long-term loan agreement for a a sizable amount of cash um, in exchange for 70 of the primo California paintings from the collection to be permanently housed at the Autry Museum, kind of a Southern California location. Mm -hmm. And then all the costume and textile collections, which the society couldn't manage or handle, all that came to the Autry. And, uh, and so suddenly we had a California art collection. We had a great costume and textile collection. We had the Southwest Museum. So an Native amazing American, Native American collection. And we had this women's initiative happening. That was all 2003. <laughs> um, and the museum was happy enough with my work. I was the chief curator through that process. And they gave me a one-year sabbatical with full pay. Mm-hmm. After that was all done, and I used that to start a PhD program and uh, went to University of Nevada, Las Vegas, to work with Hal Rothman, who was a really notable scholar working in tourism, national parks. He's since passed away. Um, but Hal was a maverick in every sense of the word, mm-hmm. and he and I fit really well together. I, I looked at USC and a lot of other schools, and I was older by then, you know, and most of the professors said, well, what could I teach you? You know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, right. You've done you know. it. And how was like, come on, I can teach you something. And, <laughs> and it was great working with him. And anyway, I got up there and he's died after about a, maybe a year and a half of into that program. And I was working on a, a project on, um, death Valley, um, as kind of the, um, death Valley in the American imagination. So it starts out as a frontier in the 19th century in the 20th century, it becomes a wilderness under the Wilderness Act of, 18, of 1964. And then in the 21st century, it becomes a homeland for the Tibbush Shoshone. And so frontier wilderness homeland, mm-hmm. that's America's perspective of the American West over three centuries. And so that, that project is still one I'd like to get back to and, and finish. Um, but when Hal passed, I ended up dropping that. I did my dissertation and then a book on Gene Autry called New Deal Cowboy, Mm -hmm. um, Gene Autry and Public Diplomacy. And so it looks at Autry as a propagandist for Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, president, uh, first with the New Deal, then with the good neighbor policy, and then with recruiting two million young men and women to start the U.S. Army Air Corps in the run-up to World War II. And did you, is that book available? Yeah, yeah, it's still out. Yeah, University of Oklahoma Press. And give us the title again. New Deal Cowboy, Uh Gene Autry and Public Diplomacy. Uh And it it was a great book, a lot of fun uh, to do, but it really looks at the way in which media. Gene Autry is an amazing guy because, and I challenge anyone to come up with another person who's done this, but he was on the A-list for motion pictures, television, sound recording, 
radio broadcasting and live performance mm. simultaneously in a period from about 1937 to 1953. Everybody wanted him. And, and you know, that's five. He's the only one with five stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But when you think about what that means, mm. you know, come up with another uh, entertainer who's in all those multimeters. Gene Autry defined uh, trans, what is it called? Um, well, multimedia, being yeah. in transmedia, yeah. and, and the key multi-platform, multi, multi-platform entertainment. Thank yeah. you. That Gene Autry really created that, and the key to multi-platform entertainment, and this is back in the '40s and '50s, maybe still today, is the music, because the song trans the song transcends all the platforms, mm-hmm. and that's how it ties together. Not and to mention, he was an amazing businessman. Amazing businessman, um, you know, hotels and. TV stations, radio stations. He got baseball into, team. Baseball team. He got into the TV and radio and ba- TV and radio stations, all up and down the West Coast, so that he'd have a platform uh, to put out the ball games. And he mm-hmm. bought the ball ga- bought the ball team, the California Angels, or the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, as they are now, <laughs> um, uh, so that he'd have content to put on his radio and TV stations. Wow. Yeah. I met him actually. Did you? Yeah. I did get to me. I'm sure you met him many times yeah. and worked with him a lot. Uh, and what was that like actually? Cause you probably did work with him a lot, right? Yeah. You know, he stayed out, he was hands off with regards to running the museum. It was really Jackie and Joanne Hale. Who, yeah. But when you're writing this dissertation, was he, he still had, around? He had already passed, but oh, okay. he was around my first five years at the Autry. I went to a lot of parties at his house and you know, got to talk with him, got to hear him sing around the sofa in yeah. the living room. And do you um, still have his voice? Yeah, he was always great, right up until the end. Yeah, uh, you he know, seemed he, very unassuming. What? Yeah, and he was very modest, um, smart as a whip, um, really an enjoyable guy. And he left such a treasure for everybody who appreciates art and history and popular culture. Um I thought I'd be turning the lights out at the Gene Autry Museum, being the Gene Autry curator. Right. But when the recession hit in 2008, um, the museum was going in a new direction. All the money that had used to come to me was going to pay for conservation of the Southwest Museum collection. Mm. You know, I wasn't. I understood that, but it was. I always talked about it as like the reunification of Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. All the money from West Germany had to go to East Germany right. to build it up, to get it on an equal playing field. That's what happened at the Autry. All the money that was in my budget disappeared, and it went to the Southwest Museum for conservation and preservation of the collection. Um, I thought that was right, but it left me kind of the odd man out. Right. And the collections that I'd worked with, which were about 120,000 objects in the Autry Museum, add to that a million objects from the Southwest Museum, and now... The Gene Autry collections are a special collection within the what was then called the Autry National Center for mm. a short period. And the museum was transitioning to more Native American topics. That's why they brought Rick West in to operate. He had retired from the National Museum of the American mm-hmm. Indian. He's been at the Autry now for 10 years, done a terrific job there. Um, but And he's Native American. And he's Native American. Right. And, um, you know, he's just wrapping up a $90 million campaign. And that's for the Southwest Museum to, to be part of inside the Autry. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, so all good things. But, you know, I it wasn't, that wasn't what I was doing yeah, when I was there. there but it affects you. <laughs> and, and so they offered me a nice buyout package, which I took in 2008. And I finished up my dissertation. You know, I went on, did a lot of individual projects around L.A., uh, helped the museum de Cultura y Artes, which is the new Mexican-American mm-hmm. museum downtown, El Pueblo de Los Angeles. I worked two, three years with the Chinese-American museum, um, was putting together my own consulting business. And then the people from the Charlie Russell Museum in Great Falls came down, and Tom Petrie came down and you know took me to lunch and asked me who I thought they might be a good director for them, and got to the end of the lunch, and he goes, well, would you be interested in the job? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm always open to hearing right. about anything. So flew up there, interviewed with them, and talked to my wife, and we decided. We called it our Montana adventure. We'd go up there and, um, you know, spend four years working with Charlie Russell's collections, mm-hmm. his original home and studio as part of the museum. That was a fantastic opportunity for someone doing Western art. And so did that. Um, there, too, after about four years, helped really turn that place around, but... They got to a point where they wanted to go in a direction that wasn't a good fit for me, so we mutually agreed to part ways. And then, and can you say what that was? 
what the direction, the direction. yeah well they wanted to do a, a capital campaign you know to raise money to cover most of the museums at size 30 some staff four or five million dollar budget they have about a, at least a million dollar uh nut that they have to hit every year for contributions mm -hmm. for gifts for philanthropy right. and everybody wants an endowment to cover that expense because it's hard money to raise and they wanted to do an endowment campaign and I agreed with that, but the way they wanted to do it, I didn't agree with. And and the way they wanted to do it is they wanted the existing staff to take it on without any additional help mm. and without a campaign staff and without a campaign consultant yeah. and all that stuff. And it was too much. We could, you know, it had, done, it had been everything I could muster to get that museum, which was a mess, going in the right direction to throw on a campaign on top of that right. without the support that was necessary. You've said, been around long enough to know what, yeah, what said, it really meant. I said, I think you need the campaign, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I just don't want to do it. And they said, great, we'll find somebody else. And they hired somebody local. And I honestly don't know where they are with their campaign these days. Um, and what year was that? 2008 you left? See, I started there in 2013, and I oh, um, left in 2000. You left Autry in 2008. I left Autry in 2008, and 8 to 13, I was doing freelance work. And just through. a little bit about the Autry. LACMO now has got, uh, uh, they did something together, right, in L.A.? Uh, With the Autry, they're like yeah. together as a one museum. Right? No, 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 they're not How together. How is that? Explain that. Yeah. They're not. They're doing collaborations. The Autry has become kind of a center for collaboration, so they have mutual agreements with multiple museums and theaters and universities around the LA area. So it's about collaboration. So they can share the works e right. e easily and, between the and, two museums. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. But they're not together. They're, okay. they're separate. LACMA is still a city of LA museum. Yeah. And the Autry, the great thing about the Autry is there's no, other than competitive grants, there's no public money in it. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, so you don't have to live by government rules, yeah. which really bog down everyone things else. Every everywhere, that just the um, the amount of money that has to go into the, um, you know, dotting the t's and or dotting the i's and crossing the t's, mm -hmm. really it takes an additional thirty percent in your budget. Wow. Just to handle the administration, and you know that's a big. It's the red tape we mm -hmm. always talk about. Yeah. It's everywhere. You see it as a business person, I'm sure. And not so bad. No? Surprisingly. Really? Yeah. Well, not so bad. I mean, there's things that occur, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and there's more and more with the internet. Right. That you generally, enter, it's related to security or accessibility and those kind of things right. that you just have to spend the money. And it does cost. Well, I, I prefer, you know, the Briscoe's the same way. Now, in both cases, the Autry and the Briscoe, um, and I think with the Russell, too, the city gave the land, mm -hmm. and so the museum sit on land that was provided um, through um, mostly city governments, uh, all city governments. But the operations, um, again, except for competitive grants, which in the case of the Briscoe, we run on a $5 million budget. We get $100,000 a year from the city. Yeah, so, nothing. And, and what that does is pays for our compliance, all the reports we have to <laughs> submit to the city. Uh, so to get to the Briscoe, so in 213, yeah. you're doing all these different things with the Chinese Museum, you're doing, and then what happens? And Yeah, so from eight, 2008 to 2013, I basically was freelancing, yeah. doing a lot of projects around LA. I was starting my own company that I called Historic Precedent, and I was, you know, I got a big, uh, I was on the verge of a $3 million grant from the county of Los Angeles, to do exhibitions in what's called the Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. Mm -hmm. It's a 10-story 1920s building right near the Staples Center, downtown LA. And um, they had spent $46 million renovating the building. Mm -hmm. it's, it was the location of the um, US Army uh, Joint Forces during World War II. And today it houses all the veterans and support groups for the military mm. in the building. Uh, it's really cool. On the 10th floor, there's a gymnasium with a basketball court. Mm -hmm. uh, completely restored, but then they wanted, they had a 3,000 square foot changing gallery, and they had all these niches where they wanted to do exhibits around um, each of the veterans groups that was located in the building. They all had collections. I can't remember the exact numbers, but it seems like about 120 boxes of archival material, 
couple of cannons, mm -hmm. maybe 50 to 100 paintings. We pulled all this stuff out of there. And I was able to set up the, um, pro the collections processing piece of it. Uh, I put together a team of curators and collections managers, conservators, um, basically forming uh, a, com a company of freelancers and got it all up and going. We got the contract to do the conservation work on or the collections management work on it. Um, and then the Russell Museum came and calling and I turned it over to my colleagues and uh, they finished phase one, but they didn't get the contract for phase two or mm -hmm. the subsequent phases. So I, I don't know that, I don't really know what happened to those collections after that. Um, uh, and I, you know, sometimes I look back and think, well, I should have just stayed in LA and, <laughs> you know, because that, the one thing I've learned is that most museums have now downsized their curatorial staffs. When I was at the Autry, we had nine, I, I had nine curators working wow. for me. And then after I left, that was down to three. Mm -hmm. And they've had three from 2008 until 2020. And they just hired two new curators. Yeah. So now there's five. Um, but everybody downsized, they got rid of their talent. And they decided they could outsource that talent and then hire it on a on a As freelance basis. basis. Yeah, you know. And so you had all these curators going out and probably getting into your business and consulting for you and other sorts of things mm -hmm. like that, um, and many other people too. Um, but I always knew that with the content knowledge that I have and the operations knowledge that I have, I'm not really worried about finding a job mm -hmm. ever again as long as my health holds out. Yeah because I just have skills that museums need and, yeah. and generally don't have anymore if they ever had them to begin with. Right. And so after you leave the Russell Museum, what yeah. year was that you were at, left them? I was at the Russell from uh, 13 until, uh, I left like uh, the end of 16, so I was there about four years. So how did the Briscoe get a hold of you? So I knew I was leaving the Russell, and uh, we were thinking about moving. We, we always kept our house in LA because my wife works for Cal Poly Pomona, and uh, which is a university there, mm -hmm. and she does online teaching. She was in the, she basically designed the pedagogy for online teaching mm. at Cal, Cal Poly. So she's been doing that 15 plus years wow. now. And uh, um, so she can work anywhere. And so we figured we'd retrench, go back to LA. And, and then in the midst of all that, uh, Jack Genther from the um, Briscoe called me and said, Hey, would you <laughs> heard you, you know, open? Yeah, consider coming out and interviewing with us. And this is another startup museum that um, you know these museums. The Russell had been around for a long time, but they had a long stretch of a bad streak with their management. And the Briscoe had only been open for three or four years, but they never got out of first gear with their management. Mm -hmm. They got the place built, and then they never were able to make it operational. Um, and so I went there. I've been there three years now. We're, we're, we're now operational. And what does that mean exactly when you um, say operational? St well, stability, um, living within your means, not hemorrhaging cash. Mm. Um, you know, run on a $5 million budget. You got to have $5 million a year to run the place. Mm -hmm. and, and the Russell was losing money every year. The Briscoe was losing money every year. There were people having to, to fund it to keep it open. So how do you do that? How do you make a museum uh, budget work? I mean, there's a, I mean, there's only a few ways to get it, right? You get right. people to donate money, you get grants, right. right? And earned income. And earned income. That would be it, right? Yeah. So in both the case of the Russell and the Briscoe, they do a um, an annual uh, exhibition and sale. And in both cases, the exhibition and sale existed before the museum. So it wasn't the museum selling off its collection or pandering to fundraising. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of exhibitions and sales now, but in the case of the Russell and the Briscoe, they're, they're a little more pure than some of the other pure fundraising initiatives. And by that, I mean that they started the sale in order to raise the money to build the museum. Mm -hmm. At the Russell, they did that in the 1920s to acquire the Russell's home and studio. They ran 28, 27, 28, 29. They ran these exhibitions and sales um, to buy the property from the city. That died out in, with the, the Depression war. and the yeah. war, mm -hmm. but then it revived in 1969, and now it's been going 50 years again, the Russell annual Russell exhibition right. and sale. In the years that I was there, we were running... Um, 
you know, generating between five and $15 million a year in art sales. That's a lot. Right. And the museum receives a commission off of each sale. And then there's a buyer's premium with the auction piece of it. So um, the That's years- whole budget. The years I was there, we were running a million dollar net, but but generating, you know, three or $4 million in revenue mm -hmm. uh, through the, well, in one year, you know, it was 10 or 12. Uh, some Thomas Moran paintings will get you there in yeah, a hurry. Really quick. Huh? We had a $3.6 million Moran in one sale. Yeah. Um, so, um, but that million dollar net is, you know, that is all earned income is how it's booked. And then you have philanthropy, gifts, contributions, and grants. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have museum store sales and membership and, you know, other things that are, uh, but the key to running a museum is membership. And, um, with a, with an art show and sale, and I'll, I'll come back to the Briscoe in a minute, but with an art show and sale, you get people to engage your museum they get to buy a piece of western art and then they're then they're then they own a piece of it right then mm -hmm. they're in your business essentially mm -hmm. and they come back year after year you make sure it's a fun party and then you've got a transactional relationship with that person just like a lot of the people in the gallery but then the trick and the magic is to convert the transactional relationship into a philanthropic relationship mm -hmm. instead of giving getting something in return if you do the job right you're then you know have the appreciation of that person and um and then they will gift you or sponsor or uh, help support you in other ways because then they want the institution to keep going and a great example at the briscoe we do a show there called night of artists every year mm -hmm. uh, it's in its 19th year this year um, it's all contemporary western art both traditional and and new new west sort and of this things. is what's coming up in march right? yeah march 27th 28th okay. there's your shout out right thank you and, and wait uh, i've got something better for those people on youtube here's the thing it's coming yeah you can go on youtube you can see the deal check our website yep check the website briscoemuseum.org uh it's a great uh sale we this year we have 80 artists about 300 works of art mm -hmm. um there's cowboys of america style martin greeley john coleman style art and then kind of more contemporary work like Billy Shank and Kim Wiggins and a variety of new artists mm -hmm. emerging. And our market there likes both, not one or the other, but both. And um, last year we did about $2.7 2 for the show overall. That includes about a half a million in sponsorship and then about $2.1 in the art sales. Um, we have a 30-piece live auction, which I added when I got there. Uh, most of these museum shows, the first night is a preview party. Sometimes it's an awards dinner for mm -hmm. artists' awards. But you got a lot of money in the house, and you're making them sit on their wallet all night long mm -hmm. and not being able to buy any, maybe a miniature you know, yeah. sale, something right. like that. So when I got to the Briscoe and I had a chance with a, with a clean slate, I introduced a 30-piece live auction on Friday night. Not all the primo pieces, because not every artist wants to be in a live auction. Most of them hate live auctions because mm -hmm. there's too much risk. And artists are inherently conservative, right. is what I've found. Um, but some of them do. They, they embrace it. And some of them want that premium that comes from selling over retail. Um, so we, we got that. You know, 10 of the pieces are above 20 grand, 10 of them are in the 10 to 20 range, and 10 are below 10. Mm -hmm. So there's something for everybody in that. But it creates so much energy and excitement, and people really, and then everything kicks off. Um, and the artists the first year all thought, oh, it's going to kill our sales for right. Saturday night. We did 720,000 the first year, two at years the ago, at the, with 30 pieces. Yeah. And, um, and then the wall sale, uh, or the luck of the draw sale, did, uh, it's a box draw, um, did, we did like two or 300,000 better than the year before, plus the live auction piece. Last year, the live auction numbers came down into the 600 something, but the wall sale went up another 500,000. Mm. So it's just, it's pump priming is what it is. And that's how I meant it to work and it actually worked. I didn't know that it was gonna happen that way, um, but it did work. And now um, uh, people are, you know, we're in the third year this year. And mm -hmm. so they expect that energy and excitement. Mark Baggiori, who's a, one of the, you know, really, emerging who i represent artist. and occasionally get a painting oh do you, you yeah. listen to this mark i need one thank you <laughs> hey, there's two of them available at the briscoe uh -huh. coming yeah up in a month. i want them in the medicine man gallery <laughs> thank you you can have them in the medicine man <laughs> yeah. i want um, mark to get all that money not me 
But we get it. We yeah. get our commission. Yeah, no, of course. I wanted to go there. Yeah. I want my own painting, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I will make him listen to this. He, uh, um, yeah, he just sold a piece at the Autry last week, this past weekend, sixty five thousand dollars. Yeah, painting. it was a wonderful painting. It's a really great. I really like that. Lots painting. of figures. Yeah, the horse coming down. That was on the cover of Western Art Collection yeah, as well. Yeah, really beautiful piece. So we'll have two of Marks. We've got a piece called uh, Father's Daughter, which is a very uh, sentimental piece of a cowboy with his daughter. They're on a trail drive, and you know that mm -hmm. fantastic Tucson clouds in the background. Mm -hmm. um, and all the beautiful colors and forms that are part of his work. And I haven't seen the second piece yet. He tells me it's coming. But And so how do you determine what artists can show at your... Sure. Well, we have an art selection committee, which mm -hmm. is anonymous, so they don't get um, petitioned. Um, but the artists submit, and then the committee decides who's in and who's out. Um, is that every year? Uh, every year. We have... Um, we'll evaluate the artists from the year... And the committee determines to churn about 10% of the artists. So if we have 80 artists, next year, eight of them won't be coming back. And why is that? Why do you do that? Um, usually it's, um, they, you know, no one's buying their work anymore. In that, in it's that the sale. Goldman Sachs thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, uh, um, and it's not because it's not good work. Sometimes it's not good work, but mostly everybody who wants one by that artist has one mm -hmm. and they're just not buying them anymore and they're buying something else instead. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's not a lifetime ban. You know, this year we have uh, 13 new artists in the show. I had two artists that dropped out cause they're doing solo shows and they couldn't produce enough work. Yeah. I had one artist that passed away and then we opened up uh, eight slots, I think for new artists. And, uh, and of those eight slots or of those 13 total slots, I think five of the 13 are artists that were in the show three, four, five years ago who are coming back mm -hmm. to it now. But sometimes it takes, a, you know, it, it's good to take a break and to refresh and sure. to come back. And, uh, um, and that's often, it's a mutual agreement. Sometimes the artists get mad, but mostly they understand it's business. And if, if you're bringing five paintings and not selling any, and you do that two, three, four years in a row, you want to keep doing that if you're the artist? Right, now. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, take a break. Like I tell them all, it's not a lifetime ban. Just take a break. And the other thing is that there's so many shows now and so many galleries, you know, a good artist can produce, what, 20, 30 paintings a year? Maybe more than that yeah, if more they're than really that. prolific. Yeah. But, but the demand for a good artist, like Mark Maggiore, we use him as an example. Yeah. He's doing about 20 paintings a year, yeah. and you no, know, he's, everybody wants them. He has demands. Same yeah. with Ed Mel. Ed, yeah. Ed is very... I've never funny. been able to get Ed Mel. Uh, well, I have a show that's opening on the 21st, and I'm gonna talk, try, to, talk how, to Jamie. <laughs> how long is that up? Uh, well, it'll be up for about probably about two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Pretty much everything gets sold yeah. by the time the opening happens, I'm afraid. Right. So, uh, it's yeah the, yeah, the ones that are in demand, it is very difficult. But But... We've we've talked to Ed before, and you know he's got a market, and he doesn't yeah, he, can't, he doesn't expand. He, he, yeah, and he can't even support right. what he has. Right. Yeah. So that's you know that's the case. Martin Greeley is one of our top selling artists, and and Martin's in the same boat. You know everybody wants his work. He sells for a premium wherever he goes. I'm just have, I'm going to get two paintings from him too. I'm just yeah pleased. To so you really have to him. go after these artists to get some of them to believe in what you're doing yeah i learned my trade this part of my trade from john garrity who was yeah. at the, the pre de west in, yeah, in oklahoma and at then at the autry he came to the autry in 97 and, and i learned i worked with him for 11 years on that show but you got to get out you got to talk to the artists you got to talk to their representative representation the gallery owners um and along those lines that we do this is something i'm pretty proud of and we're in the third year now and i think it's starting to take hold but we in like with a museum show, we don't do the traditional artist demonstration or artist lecture about their technique. I started something called the Collector Summit, and there's two versions of it, two panels, and it, each panel has an artist, a collector, and a gallery owner mm. on the panel. Mm -hmm. And the first one's called Head and In, and it looks at collectors who got engaged in the 1980s or sometime around there, but who've been in collecting a long time. Mm -hmm. And they're reaching the zenith of their collecting career. And then, what do you do? What do you do as a collector when you get to that point? You mm -hmm. know, do you sell your collection? Do you donate it to a museum that only is going to want to cherry pick it? Do you, um, you know, start your own museum? Do you give it to the kids? Right. What do you do? 
And so the pa- this panel, this year, it's George Hallmark and Mary Von Lesh from, George Hallmark's an artist, Mary Von Lesh from uh, Trailside Galleries, and Tammy Fontaine from the uh, Eddie Basher Collection, mm-hmm. representing collectors. They're going to talk about longtime collectors and what you do. In Eddie's case, he formed his own museum. Mm-hmm. You know, Mary Vaughn's got strong opinions about all this. George has been in it for a long time. Right. And so hopefully they'll give advice to longtime collectors from there. The second panel is called Heading Out, and it's new collectors, new and younger collectors who are just getting started now. Maybe they've been decorators. They buy a piece to go above the fireplace or in the niche in right. the living room. And, but they're, they're not collectors. Um, but then suddenly they wake up one day and they've got 10 pieces of and art. And they go, hey, I am a collector, I guess. And then they start to see something right. in the collection of what they purchased. You know, they like red or they like contemporary or traditional or whatever. And, uh, and then so for that group, it's like, well, when you decide you're going to be a collector, what do you do? And so on this panel, we have Mark Maggiore representing the artists. We have Bo Alexander from Maxwell Alexander right. Gallery. You know who's who's got a new business model in Los Angeles, which is an old business model in my yeah. view, but um, but it's what's old is new again. And then um, Kate Harrington, who's now I believe recently married Kate Halvin, I believe is her new name. She's the um, with Hinman Auctions. She was with Altamira right. and other yep. galleries, and she's now, as I understand it, through the Grapevine, is the head of their Western art. Yeah, division. she does a great job too, by the way. And she's a young, she th- is thirty-eight year old. Yeah, she's doing a great job. She's been all, collecting. She mm-hmm. and her husband are collectors. Yep, they so, bought a Francis Livingston from us, in fact. So they're going to talk about for young, new, and younger collectors. What are the issues and the things that you need to think about? Mm-hmm. And so, uh, the first year was a little rough. Last year was really great, and then this year I'm expecting that to go gangbusters. <laughs> and I'd love to have you come out and be part <laughs> of that. I knew this panel. was coming. Yeah. Well, yeah. you want me the old school, the old guy. Hey, you, or you want me the young guy? <laughs> you, t- you tell me. You tell me where you fit. I don't know. I think I could fit in either one of them. <laughs> I see it every day. I deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I give those lectures every day to people on both ends. Right. Well, and, and uh, you know, there, this is a divide for purposes of a panel, but everybody, for the most part, goes to both panels. And yeah, it's a lively I would discussion. Think so. And how many people show up to one of these lectures panels? Um, you know, last year, I'd say 100 plus yeah. for each. Yeah, I like the idea though. I think it's really smart. Well, and, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to introduce the look. You have to keep some arrows in your quiver, right? Because you got to have every year. You have to have something new, or people get bored and they think, "Well, I've been there, done that." Right. So this year, um, you know, a couple of years ago, it was this collector summit and the live auction. Um, this year, what happened when we did the live auction is our artist awards got short shrift. So we've moved that to a special luncheon now to do the Artist Awards. Mm-hmm. Mary Ross Buckholz has designed a new award. It's really beautiful. So that premieres this year. And then the other thing, in our event space, we can only seat 330 inside, and then we have a garden area that seats another 250. But the folks in the garden are really put out when we do the live auction because they, they're not in the room. Mm. What we try to do is make sure all the buyers, the real buyers, are in the room and the, the folks outside are enjoying it. Looky loose. Right. You know? <laughs> um, but last year we had some new people that ended up in the garden who said we're buyers and we're offended. So this year <laughs> I'm bringing in one of those high res digital yeah. billboards. Highly smart to do this. It's yes. going to be like eight feet tall and 40 feet wide, and it'll f- have the live auction, yeah. which is 100 feet away on that screen, and we'll have spotters out there. So yeah. it'll be a virtual auction for yeah. them. They'll be one step removed from the action. Uh, it's cost a lot of money to put that screen up there, but we're going to do it because, and then we'll find out if there's real buyers out there or not. Eventually, we're going to get to a bigger venue where we can put everyone together, but we're a little ways away from making that reality. And can people buy online as well, or do they have to be at the museum opening? So um, they can buy online. Um, they, uh, they can't buy online. They probably can they probably, if they pay their fee for the opening, maybe can get a surrogate or somebody so to bid you can, for them. You can do a proxy or yeah. an absentee bid right. for either the live auction or for the box draw, the wall sale piece of it. Um, you can do it that way, but we don't have online bidding because it's just not big enough. Right. The the overhead to do that is. But if you want to do the other, you still have to buy a ticket for that gala or not, or you can just. No, you do not. You can send in your absentee yeah. bid, and then we'll for the box draw piece of it. The Saturday night, we drop your slip in. It says absentee on it. Yeah. If it's pulled, 
we don't expect you to come and fill out the paperwork. It's already been done in advance. We just expect you to buy it. Right. Uh, it's a it's an intent to purchase. Yeah. And then for the live auction, it's the same thing. It's, if you ever did an auction where you did absentee or proxy, mm-hmm. works the same way. But we but we don't do online. I mean, yeah. you can go under our website and see what's available. Right. And then call us or email us yeah. and buy a piece. But the actual like eBay style online bidding, we right. we don't have enough volume to really make that worthwhile. And so you do this as one of your main fundraisers, right? This brings in yeah, it brings a couple we, million. Our our goal is to to net a million. Yeah. We haven't quite gotten there with it yet, but we're building in that. And then our other uh, earned income piece is we have a pavilion and we rent that space for weddings and corporate mm-hmm. events. And there too, our goal is to net a million from the pavilion. Uh, we do. 150, 200 events a year. Mm, that's a lot. Um, yeah, it's a, well, it's on the Riverwalk. It's a prime location. Ah, got it. Yeah, everybody wants to be there. How we big got, is the museum, by the way? Museum is fifty-five thousand yeah. square feet, so it's medium sized. Yeah. And it's young, though, right? You've done this for three it's, years. How long? I've been the there three years. It's six years we've yeah, been so open. It's a really young museum. It's really young, just getting started. And then our we've got our membership and our museum store, which is maybe another half million uh, comes out of that, and then. Um, uh, our yes. contributions and our grants are about 1.2 million. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so it's it's we have these big two big earned income pieces that gives us you know approximating two million dollars a year mm-hmm. out of what we need to run the place, and most museums don't have that. And do you have a collections? Oh yeah, yeah. We've yeah. got we you know we're young, so we we've got about 1,200 pieces in our permanent collection. A lot of it is contemporary. There's a, a good mix of contemporary meaning just con- living artists that living uh, yeah. Or and, 20th century. Yeah, and they're mainly of West of the West. We're, yeah, we're a museum of the American West. We're yeah. an art museum of the American West, so it's almost everything is in that category. We do have some historical artifacts, things like we have Santa Ana's sword is in our yeah, collection. Yeah, I saw that. And so we have some and historical... And Pancho Villa's saddle. Pancho Villa's saddle. Yeah, I watched. Roy Rogers' saddle. Yeah. And so those types of things that are in the collection are shown more as works of art than as historical context. Mm-hmm. We've got a nice display about the Alamo and the Battle of the Alamo that has a lot of firearms and uniforms, and it's actually a, in a, in a really great scale model of the battle at dawn, mm-hmm. you know, on the final And day. how many curators are there? We have one curator mm-hmm. who's, who's new, yeah. and, I, and then I serve as the chief curator, and in addition to president and CEO, I also manage all the Mm-hmm. Con- creative content side right. of the house. It's kind of fun though, right? I mean, to be able to keep your hand in that. Exactly. That's why I really like, I mean, the Autry was so big and 15, $20 million budget, 100, 150 employees. You know, I, when you get to the management level, you're really doing HR and fundraising right. and that's it. I grew up in this as a curator. I like the small and medium sized museum because you can keep a hand in mm-hmm. the creative content. And if I couldn't do that, and I was just doing fundraising and HR, then I'm yeah. out. Yeah. Because that's the fun stuff, the collecting and the exhibits. Um, my, you know, if I had to pick an expertise for me where I'm the strongest, it's in the exhibit work and in taking, building a story around a collection and sharing it with people who are interested or don't even know that they might be interested. And in most the of the matter. shows that you do are around your collection or do you bring in shows as well? Well, because our collection is so small, um, we do, we're borrowing a lot of work um, where we can. We do, right now I'm trying to build out a five-year exhibit calendar, so I'm booking a number of shows that are traveling right now. A number of them are photography I've got shows. one for you when you're done. Great. I'll well, tell you, a yeah. great one actually. Well, I'm lo- always looking yeah. for those. We're traveling our first show right yep. now. It's uh, Andy Warhol and Billy Shank, Yeah, Western Pop. I love that one. And uh, I'm writing the essay for that catalog right now. Um, and uh, I'm still looking for venues. I need one more venue. So if you, I'm going to ask you about that afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but um, that'll get us into the traveling exhibit business. Um, uh, we have the Warhol collection, and then Billy Shank is providing a, a, his retrospective. Right. So that's been a nice um, union there. Um, we're doing a Cowboy Artists of America show in two years. This last summer, I did a show called Into the New West, and I borrowed most of the collection from the Booth Museum in mm-hmm. Cartersville, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Seth Hopkins is really smart and terrific yep. with we had all him this on. stuff. Yeah, he he really knows his stuff. But Seth uh, helped me put this together. We used the um, Institute of American Indian Arts as the core for it, which, of course, began here in Tucson. Um, and uh, 
and then built around that, basically arguing that the IAIA artists, um, Kevin Redstar, yeah, Fritz Shoulder, Shoulder, those guys, TC Cannon, they basically opened, opened the door for contemporary Western art for all the non-Indian artists to jump in as well. Yeah. The Kim Wigginses and the yeah. Billy Shanks and um, made it okay to, or showed them how to do that basically. And then at the, almost virtually the same time, you have the Cowboy Artists of America forming in the mid 60s. I think IAI is 62 and CA is 65. 65. Mm -hmm. And so here beginning in the 60s, you have the two main um, schools of Western art, right. traditional and contemporary, emerging simultaneously, not exactly at odds with one another because they're kind of doing their own thing. But, um, but all of us working in this field today, we live in the shadow of one or both of these mm -hmm. uh, organizations. So I did the IAIA show last year. I'm going to do the CAA show oh, next year. And then my goal after that is to do a combined show that looks at Cowboy Artists of America and Institute of American Indian Arts as two parts of one whole. Oh, interesting. Yeah, these are all cannons behind you that you're looking at, by are the way. Really? Yeah. All the uh, ones, all these drawings are all I'm glad I'm cannons. facing. <laughs> I'm glad I'm facing this way. But he was so terrific. It's so yeah. sorry that he didn't yeah. have, you know, live longer to produce yeah, more work. Died at 31. Yeah. Um, but but this is the world that we live in, and it's a fantastic. You know, you look at Tucson and Scottsdale and Santa Fe and Jackson Hole and all these places. The Western Art Circuit. There's what. Half a dozen magazines, mm -hmm. dozens of galleries. Yeah, and how is that going for you in, in San Antonio? I mean, this is a new museum. Right. Everything in the world seems to be going, I want contemporary, but yet here you are doing Western right. art and native art as well. Right. Are you finding a young audience or an audience? You know, we had uh, last year in our Nut of Artists sale, we had 96 buyers. 56% of them, their first show was in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So we've got that younger audience coming. I attribute it to Jessica Elliott, who was a, our 36 year old board chair, who now uh, she's, we've had, we're two chairs removed from her term, mm -hmm. but she brought in a whole cadre of younger San Antonio and South Texas people. Now Texas has the advantage of a lot of oil money mm -hmm. and anybody who's been in the Western art business knows that the core of the, the buyers come out of the oil industry, yep. at least the big buyers. Yep. And so we've got that in our own backyard. So that's the advantage. And Rob and Nicole McLean, uh, other board member, uh, have really continued to cultivate that younger audience. And uh, young people in Texas grew up with Western art. Mm -hmm. It's not unusual to them. Now, they will gravitate toward more contemporary pieces. Many of them will. But they also understand the traditional. And what, what I found with, with new collectors, the younger ones especially, is they start out with the contemporary because mm -hmm. it's bright and shiny. And then if they stick with it, they all move into the historical and the traditional because that's where the Russells and the Remingtons, those are the core Dixon. pieces, Dixon. <laughs> you know, those are that's the core. Yeah. And if you're going to really embrace this, that's where you're going to end up. So you can be contemporary, you can be interested in contemporary, but that doesn't mean you, you have to be disinterested in the historical pieces. Right. And you're doing all. We're doing all of it. Yeah. And we're finding an audience for all of it. And in many cases, the same person is buying traditional and contemporary. Yeah, I find I find that to be very true. Right, and that that's the that's the, you know, the silver lining. There's a lot of gloom and doom with you know the de generations dying off. But as a historian, I went back and I looked at every generation of Western art buyers mm -hmm. since the 1890s. Mm -hmm. Guess what? They all died off, <laughs> one after another. That's true. And they were all replaced with a new generation yeah. that that continued the tradition, continued to be in, interested in Western art. Um, our generation right now, we're in a generational shift in many ways culturally right now, but the buyers that came in in the 80s are all, you know, they're heading in off the range. They're done mm -hmm. for the most part. Although, I, you know, I bet you have plenty of 80-year-old people still buying oh, yeah, art. For sure. Yeah. And building their collections because you get the fever and, you, and mm -hmm. it doesn't let you go. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and we all need people to have that fever. Um, but for the, for a lot of others, they're trying, it's time to cash in, you know, and, and, um, uh, now, and we're seeing this glut of art hitting the market all at once, which is creating a whole new issue. Um, but that's really good for the next generation. 
it's not good for the people selling because they're not going to realize the money that they hope to realize from their sales. But what they're going to do is feed the next generation who are, you know, the Thomas Gilcreases of the mm-hmm. 2020 who are going to be able to buy work, you know, at a reasonable price and build and grow their collections and then get that same fever and, and keep it going for mm-hmm. the next generation. So I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think everyone will be happy with the transition. A lot of collectors who got in it as an investment are going to be disappointed. Right. Um, but it's going to go. It's going to keep going. And there will be another generation. Well, part of it may be funded and pushed by the museums, quite frankly. Yeah. You know, the Scottsdale Museum of the West, yourself, the right. booth, you know, Idol Jordan. Because I think a lot of the dealers that get older in this field, I don't know if there's that many younger dealers going at this point into Western art, though there's some. Right. Bo, Bo is one. And, right. you know, so we, I think it's important to see that component as well. Right. Uh, I don't know how we do it, but, you know, do podcasts, I guess. <laughs> well, this really helps because they're all on social media. Yeah. You know, and if you, because we can link to this podcast, for example, and then all of your 80 yeah. other podcasts, and that's going to, you know, that'll feed the beast with regards to content that kids are looking for. Yeah, and they are. I've had yeah. young young people talk to me and say they've heard the podcast and go, oh, maybe there is a right. uh, a, road, a, a, a road here that I have never seen before or even considered. I could be a Western art dealer, a Native American art dealer, right. and I'll come in when all these guys are dying off, and I'll be able to <laughs> be a leader in the field quicker. Well, it beats working for a living, yeah, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is, you could you could do a lot worse things than what you're doing or what I'm doing. Oh yeah. You know, it's, and, and this goes back to that whole identity thing, right? I mean, in all this is, this is where human nature, American culture, diversity, it's all there. And, you know, a lot of Western art gets billed as cowboy art, but who are the cowboys and the vaqueros, right? It's the most diverse culture that you're going to find anywhere. Um, it's not an old white guy thing. Right. Uh, and it's still alive. Too, and and it's still alive. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, I want to give a plug for John Langmore. Did, just did a new documentary film called The Cowboys. Okay. If you get a chance to screen that here in Tucson, it is fantastic. I've seen it twice now. Went to the premiere at the Austin Film Festival. Hmm. Langmore is a second generation Western photographer. He worked the ranches for 16 years. He went back first and photographed and then went back and made a film. Hmm of the, um, what he calls the big outfit ranches, the ranches that are run in, you know, thousands of head right. of cattle on right. 60, 70, 100,000 acres mm-hmm. or more. And uh, they still, you know, cowboy in the old ways. Oh, yeah, for cause sure. Because they can't get into those nooks and crannies on those big ranches any other way. Um, and uh, and that's, it's a, you know, I, I've seen it twice. It was better the second time yeah. than it was the first time. And where so. can people find it, yeah? Um, so it's- uh, is it something that's on Netflix or Amazon? He, or you know, it's in the. It's he's at the film festivals right Still. now, so he's okay. trying. He's trying to get it. Right. I think he. I think network, Netflix actually showed some interest in yeah. it, but he hasn't gotten a, an agreement. Well, we need yet. to get Langmore on my podcast. Actually, I will refer him to you. Yeah. So he's yeah. he's really terrific, and uh, and I'm just so happy that he's done this film because, you know, I screened it two weeks ago. We had 150 people show up, and that's all the chairs I had. Are, yeah. You know, at the at the film festival in Austin, there were seven hundred people in the audience. Wow, um, people are really interested in it, and a lot of young people are. You know, they go in there and go, "Ah, I'd like to be a cowboy. That sounds cool." <laughs> yeah, it's not. And then they see the life, and it's like fifteen hundred bucks a month yeah, to that's do that. Super hard to be a cowboy. <laughs> I, know, I know cowboys. Yeah, it's it's you know, and the people who do it, there's a great the the um, handbill for it has a pair of shaps, and it's written across. If you want to be, you know, if you want to live like a cowboy, be prepared to suffer <laughs> uh, because it's a hard life. And the people who choose it yeah. do it because they love it, not because they're yeah. going to get rich doing it. No, that's right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. most of them die doing it because that's you know, what you do. You get injured or hurt or something takes you out. But there is no life after. If you're a cowboy, when you're done cowboying, there is nothing left. You're either the foreman or you're not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's a great. I'll look for that. But that's what gets to why this stuff is important because it gets to who we are as mm-hmm. a people, who we are as a nation, what matters, right? When it comes down to values, and we're a nation in search of values right now, and they're right in front of us. Mm-hmm. We just have to embrace it. And and as a museum person, I have to find that audience. I have to reach them. I have to help them see it to cut through all the dross of everything that's all the filter or the noise that's cluttering up their lives right now. 
And that's not easy to do, and you kind of do it one at a time. But um, but the key for any museum is building membership because if people pay you 50 bucks, 60 bucks to become a member, mm -hmm. get on your mailing list, then they're in. And then every year you can give them a reason to support you more. Well, I've heard great things about the museum, by the way, from other Thank artists. You. Yeah. Thank you. yeah, yeah, and your show. They've they've all liked it. It's all been positive, which is which is a hard thing to do sometimes. Yeah. It's easy to get a negative rap real quickly, especially if you're a new museum. But I've heard only positive things. Well, I have a real passion for it. That's what it takes. You know, you have to you have to own it. You have to believe yeah. in it. You have to care. And if you're just going through the motions, yeah. it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that's why you're here now. Yeah. Exactly. You made the effort to get here. And yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a lot of other places you got to do it. Well, I, you know, I try to, I, I have, I'm working in San Antonio. My permanent residence is LA. So I make this trek a couple times a year. In the winter, I go through Tucson. The yeah. summer, I go through Santa Fe. Yeah. And I just try to, you know, preach the gospel on, on the mission. Yeah. yeah preach exactly. the gospel. Well, it's really great having you. Uh, I will get out to see your show. We can talk great. about the other good things. So one more time for the show that is going to be coming out for the people. It's on March the... March 27th and 28th. So I'll try to get this podcast out before then so people will hear it. That'd be great. And get hooked up to it. Great, Michael. Thank, Thank you, you Mark. for coming by. Appreciate the we time. We have lots to talk about. I'll tell you about this uh, exhibit that you are going to love. I can't wait. free, too. <laughs> <laughs> Even all better. Right, all right, Briscoe Museum. Go see it, folks. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.